about echocardiography and how to interpret. And I'm going to cover when you should be doing an echocardiogram briefly, and then I'm going to concentrate predominantly on how to interpret the images, and then we'll go through three example reports, uh, so how to interpret the reports. When did you do an echocardiogram? Well, you know, we might want to assess a heart murmur, we might want to assess patients with suspected heart failure. Remember an NT Pro BMP is a very good rule out for heart failure, you might want to do that first. If a patient has an arrhythmia, we almost certainly want to know that their heart is structurally normal or abnormal. If patients have an acute coronary syndrome, then we need an echo to know what their LV function is to tell them when they can start driving again. If they don't have an echo, they have to wait a month. If they've got uh, better than moderately impaired, so an ejection fraction over 40%, they can drive again after a week. So it's that would have a big impact on me if I had an acute coronary syndrome. Um, we also want to know if they've got heart failure uh, weakness of their heart following an acute coronary syndrome, because then we could push lots of heart failure drugs and obviously there are lots and lots of other things like suspected endocarditis that might lead us to do an echocardiogram. We very often are asked to do echocardiograms before operations and that's one of those areas where it's it's absolute uh, dogma that we do these things but the evidence base for them is appalling. I mean, it just doesn't exist. And an echocardiogram doesn't really tell you if a patient is going to get through surgery or not. An echocardiogram, um, you know, the LV systolic function doesn't tell you how long a patient's going to live for, uh, how much fluid you can give them, how fast. Uh, the symptoms a patient has will tell you that. If they can run, um, you know, five miles, even if they've got severe LV impairment, they'll cope with surgery. Uh, if they're not so physically fit, then doing a cardiopulmonary exercise test is a much better way of assessing surgical risk. <coughs> Cardiology has got lots of cool toys and I love echoes because it's just you're there with the patient, you're getting the diagnosis actually by two scans in clinic frequently um, and I, I get the result and give it to the patient then and there it's so much more immediate but we can also put the echo probe down the throat and when the lungs aren't in the way and the uh, adiposity isn't in the way you can get much clearer images uh, particularly of things like artificial valves and endocarditis questions. Um, we can also do coronary angiograms or cardiac MRI scans. We can give a radioactive dye and see how it's taken up by the heart. So if there's a gap in brightness, that's because there's poor blood supply to that bit of the heart. Um, and we can do cardiac CT and image the coronary arteries. So there are loads and loads of tests, but ECHO has got a wonderful place within those. And we're really struggling for ECHO at the moment. COVID-19 has impacted our ability to do ECHOs and we've got a big backlog. So. Here is an echocardiogram of a normal patient, and I'm going to quickly show you a few views so that you can become experts in echocardiography. This is a diagram of what it should look like. So here we have the left ventricle. We've got the papillary muscles and the cordy attached to the mitral valve leaflets. We have the right ventricular outflow tract. The right ventricle is tacked on the side of the left ventricle like an afterthought. It's got less than 10% the muscle mass of the left ventricle, and it has very little work to do relative to the left ventricle. So it doesn't need to, to be designed as a cylindrical organized pumping chamber. It just gets sort of the leftovers and gets tacked on the side. <coughs> we got the aortic valve here and the aortic root here, and it normally bulges out slightly at the bottom, not so well demonstrated in this diagram, but can you see here it's slightly wider at the root of the aorta, and that's those are the, um, the coronary uh, arteries come off uh, the sides of this slight outswelling at the bottom of the aorta. So here this is uh, a fairly good uh, echo view of that parasternal long axis view we call it and here can you see the muscle is not only coming in it's also thickening and it's all coming in equally and it's pumping out over 50 percent of what's inside it each beat if you imagine the area or better volume inside this over 50 percent of that volume is going uh, out through the aortic valve <coughs> 
So this is a normal image and we need to image the heart from lots of different directions because it's not uh, possible to appreciate all the different walls of the heart from one view. And in echocardiography, if you get a view like this, it's quite easy to interpret. It's much harder where the endocardial definition, the sort of ability to see the wall is much less clear and you can sort of think maybe it's moving, but maybe it's uh, just that the thing's moving in and out of the plane of your echo image. You're sending a beam of ultrasound that's about a centimetre thick. <clears throat> So this flat image is actually looking at about a centimetre thick section of cardiac tissue. Now we can put colour across valves or structures to see if there's flow. The colour works like uh, we, you know, uses a Doppler effect. You know how an ambulance goes nina 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 as it whizzes past you and the, the rate of the nina uh, extends as it goes past you and the same thing happens with the red blood cells moving within the ultrasound jet so they affect the uh, the uh, the ultrasound uh, the, the, the the vibrations and that can be converted into these color images and red is towards the probe which is at the top <coughs> This is uh, just to the left of the sternum at the moment. Um, so it's at the, the top of the heart and so red towards it, blue away. And can you see how the mitral valve is opening here? And we get this surge of orangey red as blood comes from the eight left atrium into the left ventricle. And then you get this tiny little puff of blue here as the valve closes. And that's normal because as the valve closes, inevitably a little bit of blood goes back into the atrium but if there's a lot of that blue that would be a concern and there would be a leaky mitral valve so this is a trace of mitral regurgitation and when it says trace of mitral regurgitation or any valvular problem um, uh, any any valvular regurgitation that's normal because you often get a little bit as the valve closes <coughs> we can take pictures from lots of different angles and I'm not going to show you them all today because we don't have time but this is the four chamber apical view so now the probe is in over the apex beat basically um, and we can see the left ventricle here looking like the cylinder we know it is the right ventricle pretending to be a nice cylinder realistically it's just tacked on the side uh, far less muscle mass of the right ventricle and it usually appears slightly smaller than the left ventricle in this view can you see how the heart shortens top to bottom as well as side to side can you see how everything's thickening as well as moving remember that if this bit it's, it, this bit's still attached to the rest of the heart, so this bit could be dead and it would still move, but we're looking to see is it thickening? And we can see that yes, this tissue is thickening. We've got the mitral valve here, tricuspid valve here, atrial septum down here. Now, that's normal. What about this patient? I've not shown you this view yet. I'm very naughty, I do apologise, but this is a parasternal short axis view. And that's imagine if you slice through the ventricle horizontally around the midsection, you can see these thick structures of the papillary muscles and that allows you to see the front of the heart, the back of the heart, uh, the lateral wall and then the intraventricular septum, the right ventricle tacked on the side. We look at the heart upside down. So our probe is here and the heart is upside down. The pediatric team look at the heart the other way up, but this is you know, just the way we always have done things. So left side is inverted as with all imaging when we do it in adult cardiology. Um, so what do you think is going on with this heart? Anybody want to type in the chat or unmute themselves? Do you think this is a normal left ventricular systolic function or do you think there's a problem with this heart? And if so, what problem do you think there is? Yes, very good. So LV systolic function looks to be impaired. So can you see how this is not emptying 50% of the volume? Remember, that doesn't mean that this comes in 50% because that distance, distance and 
volume are two very different things, but 50% of what's in here is not being ejected. It looks as if this might be about 40% of the volume being ejected if you just look at it at a glance. But actually, it's probably worse than that. And you, can anybody tell me why function is down before I explain why it's worse than that in more detail? So imagine the cursor in the middle and look around the heart muscle. Is everything coming in equally? And is the wall thickening equally around the whole of the heart? And I think if you do that, you can probably agree with me that this bit's thickening nicely and coming in. This bit's thickening very nicely and coming in. But this bit, while it's moving, isn't thickening. And all of this bit here, again, it's moving because it's attached to the other bits of the heart muscle, but it's not thickening. So this is the front and side of the heart. And if we come over onto this view, can you see how the apex of the heart doesn't look to be moving at all? And can you see that this bit is thickening and moving and this bit is thickening and moving, but the apex round to here isn't. Now we don't see the anterior wall in this. The anterior wall is in front of the picture and behind the picture. So we have to rotate the probe round by 90 degrees to look at the front and the back of the heart. And I'm not showing you that. But here, this looks like probably moderate to severe left ventricular systolic impairment because we've lost so much apical function. Because look, the heart isn't shortening longitudinally. It's coming in side to side at the base, but it's not shortening lengthwise particularly. So this is a significant reduction in heart function secondary to an anterior myocardial infarction. Just look at that in comparison to this image where you see all this being lifted up and everything coming in nicely, particularly towards the apex. Can you see how the apex is not wonderfully well seen here? And you might argue that's my skills as a sonographer. This was taken um, some years ago by me. Um, and by an inferior machine, I might add as well. But uh, if you can't see the apex very well, that's when the technicians often report possible left ventricular apical thrombus, particularly in a non-moving apex like this. You can see how the blood here might be fairly stationary and might tend to clot. So what does left ventricular impairment mean? We tend to report severe, moderate, severe, and we don't that sometimes you see numbers and we tend to use them interchangeably and that's because we kind of they are interchangeable when we say moderate to severe we mean the range 30 to 35 percent it, it means the same thing uh, but uh, it's, it is a source of confusion I find because we seem to use them interchangeably and, and they are basically I mean exactly the same thing when I say severe we don't tend to quote a number below 30 percent because we manage all of these patients the same and it doesn't necessarily mean that much uh, but it, somebody with an injection fraction of 15 percent is a very, very sick patient, uh, generally speaking. So it's, it can be quantified below 30%. It's just we, we use that as a bracket. There aren't many patients whose ejection fraction is, is that low. Uh, sorry, it is, it's 15%. There are lots of people with it, with it less than 30%. Um, what, doesn't, what, what, what else does it mean? Well, it, it, it affects what we call it. It affects whether we can get the community heart failure team to see patients. They won't see patients with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and it affects the medications enormously. We've had talks on heart failure, so I won't go over this in detail, but there are hugely important medications we can give to patients with left ventricular systolic impairment. The ones with relatively preserved ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction, we have much less uh, that we can do that's going to be life altering for them. But the one thing that LV impairment really does not mean is symptoms and prognosis. So patients can have preserved ejection fractions and be dying of heart failure. Um, patients can have severe weakness of their heart and go dirt biking at the weekend. They, uh, if they're well treated, can be symptomatically well, even with severe LV impairment. Um, 
I've already done this, I think, through the heart failure talk, but it's if you look, this is the line of people on good treatment with ACE inhibitor and beta blockers. This is the line of people not on ACE and beta blockers. The difference in survival is enormous over the course of a year. So crucial that these patients get well treated. Um, and even patients on the latest and best medications, these Cubitrol valsartans, who have uh, lower rates of, of mortality, for example, than ACE inhibitor patients, they're still ending up in hospital. They're still dying of heart failure. They're still symptomatically deteriorating. So really important not to say your heart failure patient is stable and we'll just carry on with what they're taking. It's really important to get them properly optimized on medications. Back to echoes. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this patient? So I'm being naughty again. I'm showing you an entirely different view again. So this one is taken from the abdomen and you can see the liver here and you can see the heart with a big pericardial effusion around it. So somebody suggested tamponade and everybody else has said pericardial effusion. Can you tell me who's right? <clears throat> so is this a pericardial effusion or tamponade? So somebody else has weighed in on the tamponade. Excellent. And lots of people don't have an opinion. So there is echo evidence of cardiac compromise here. Can you see the collapse of the right ventricular free wall here and of the atrium that's less specific, the right ventricular free wall collapse? That's fairly suggestive of tamponade. It's a big effusion, but tamponade is a clinical diagnosis. So you diagnose it uh, clinically based on symptoms like tachycardia and elevation of the JVP and cardiogenic shock rather than um, from echo, but this is very strongly suggestive of tamponade, and so we need to get a needle in and drain that fluid out. <clears throat> if you want to know more about that, there is a talk on the YouTube site on uh, on pericardiosynthesis, which covers lots of echoes and how it's done. Right, so now you've experts in interpreting images. Imagine a, an echo report and imagine a patient who's 65 year old and has got a heart murmur. And I know you don't bother reading the entire reports, you just read the summary. So enjoy reading this summary. We've got normal size left ventricle with preserved systolic function and grade one diastolic dysfunction. We've got mild aortic stenosis and mild mitral regurgitation. We've got normal right ventricular size and systolic function and moderate tricuspid regurgitation, normal sized atrium. So this patient's got a murmur. I've not told you anything else about their symptoms, but if I tell you that this is a, an asymptomatic murmur, it's just by chance their GPs noticed a heart murmur. Which of these findings that you will often see written on echocardiograms is of most concern? So everybody has to vote now. You have to consider A, B, C or D. So are you worried about the diastolic dysfunction, grade one diastolic dysfunction? So that means the heart's getting stiffer. It's not a term we tend to use, diastolic dysfunction. Or are we worried that this mild aortic stenosis, which is not causing any symptoms, is a bother? Or this mild mitral regurgitation? Or is D, D, everybody likes D, yes, D, it's moderate. It must be the thing we're most worried about. And we've got somebody voting for C now. C, yes, mild mitral regurgitation. I wouldn't like to have mild mitral regurgitation. <clears throat> Let's make this personal. Imagine that I'm an all-powerful being and I have got the power to give you a gift and I'm offering you either mild aortic stenosis or mild mitral regurgitation. You've got to have one. If you don't opt for one, I'll be really, really kind to give you both. Who wants B and who would like C? So AS is easier to manage than MR. I'd prefer C, B, 
So there's a lot of uncertainty there, isn't there? The answer here is mild mitral regurgitation probably is not of significance. I might well want to repeat the echocardiogram in five years time. It's just possible that that's going to progress. I'd want to, I'll talk more about mitral regurgitation later in the talk, but I'd want to know if it was uh, uh, functional or a problem with the mitral valve. So that is not totally discountable. Grade one diastolic dysfunction is a normal finding in a 65 year old. So that's irrelevant and is just not a helpful thing really in the report anyway. Mild aortic stenosis though is going to get worse. It might not be causing any problems now, but it is going to get worse. And if that patient lives long enough, they will end up needing an aortic valve replacement. And I would expect them to need it in about 10 years time. So they are going to need to worry about this for the next 10 years and be screened for this for the next 10 years or monitored for this progressing for the next 10 years. And then they're going to need aortic valve surgery. And then that aortic valve replacement is going to slowly wear out and need to be replaced again at some point. And so if it was you, if you've got mild aortic stenosis, that is going to shorten your life expectancy considerably because you won't be able to have that many valve replacements. You might, if you're fit and you keep yourself fit, get through three and that might get you to 70. If you've got mild mitral regurgitation and it's just functional, uh, you could live out the rest of your days and it never get any worse. So you definitely would rather have C if you can choose between B and C. Moderate tricuspid regurgitation is a bit odd. Um, how does one slow the progression of aortic stenosis? The answer is we can't. We simply can't. There is absolutely nothing we can do that slows the progression of aortic stenosis. It will get gradually worse with time. Moderate tricuspid regurgitation, I would be a bit puzzled by that finding. I wouldn't really understand it with normal right ventricular size and systolic function. I might be wondering, do they have pulmonary hypertension? That might merit further assessment. If the patient was 85, I'd ignore it. That's not something I'd worry about at 85. But at 65, um, it would not be causing the murmur. Tricuspid regurgitation, I've only ever once heard a murmur from tricuspid regurgitation, and that was a very unusual patient. You won't normally hear it, uh, but probably that's just a red herring. Um, so aortic stenosis needs monitoring, and why is it? Well, <clears throat> the way aortic stenosis progresses is you've got high pressure blood shooting across that valve and damaging the leaflets a little bit as it does that. And the body naturally repairs the leaflets and that works very well. But over time, those repairs eventually become less effective than the original native pristine valve. And because they're not as good, it means the valve leaflets are not as flexible, they become a bit thickened um, and stiffer. And so the pressures, the shear stresses across them become greater. And so more damage happens, more repairs happen, and more stenosis happens. And so it gradually becomes tighter and tighter and tighter, and it will progress inexorably. There is nothing we can do. We've tried high dose statins, which were completely useless. Um, Maybe we'll find something in the future, but it's a huge ask because how are you going to sh stop that sheer stress? How are you going to make the body repair things better than it repairs things already? Um, that's uh, something which I, I don't see happening anytime soon. And everybody will get severe aortic stenosis eventually. Most patients, it'll affect them. Um, you know, over 100. There are plenty of effects in their 90s, some that affects in their 80s, a few in their 70s. And younger patients, often if the valve isn't made perfectly, the stress across it is greater than it should be and it wears out sooner. So some patients develop severe aortic stenosis even in their 20s if the valve is very badly made. Oh, and you can imagine the heart working harder and harder trying to get blood across this tightening valve. This is an example of what this patient might look like if we leave them another 10 years. The Over here I've got you a normal image. So this is the aortic valve. You can see the three cusps of the aortic valve, nice and smooth, opening nice and wide. Over here can you see how 
Um, this patient probably has a pseudo bicuspid aortic valve, which is why it's got stenosed. Can you see how bright and calcified and thickened it is? See how this leaflet isn't moving at all. This leaflet is barely moving. And can you almost see the tips vibrating as the blood shoots across them? And the problem is that you can't rely on patients to get symptoms of breathlessness and then sort them out because this patient, their heart has got knackered and worn out by having to work really hard against this aortic stenosis. And it's too late for this patient to probably to fix their aortic valve. If, if you fix it, maybe, maybe they'll do OK, but they'll they'll they have done so much damage to their heart that their prospects are not good. Whereas if we'd caught them six months earlier or maybe a year earlier, we could have fixed the valve and then they could have carried on pretty normally after that. So it does need to be monitored. If, if patients are running marathons every other weekend, then they'll come and tell you when they're symptomatic and you can spot them a mile off. But most patients, you know, think of your heart as like a sports car engine. You can lose fifth gear, fourth gear, probably third gear without most people actually noticing because of their sedentary lifestyles. So really important to spot them before it gets as bad as this. Patient two. Imagine we have a 42 year old gentleman admitted with peripheral edema and breathlessness and in fast atrial fibrillation and the patient is a known heavy alcohol drinker. And while they're in hospital, they have an echocardiogram done and then they have an MRI scan done because we want to know why they've got severe LV impairment. And this scan shows that we've got uh, mild to moderately dilated left ventricle. That's important. If the heart's not pumping very much blood, then it tends to dilate because if you're not pumping very much of what's in you, but you're much bigger, that's actually more mils. It's a bigger amount of volume because there's so much more volume in you to start off with, even if you're only pumping a relatively small amount of your your um, bloated left ventricle out. So it tends to get bigger to try and cope with the fact that it's severely weakened and that's a bad thing. Dilated left ventricle is a bad thing um, and so it's mildly dilated, severely impaired. There's no evidence of myocardial infarction or reversible ischemia so this is as we suspected either related to fast atrial fibrillation or due to uh, the heavy alcohol intake. Uh, it could be chicken or egg, heavy alcohol intake causing heart failure and atrial fibrillation or atrial fibrillation causing heart failure. There is severe left atrial dilatation and mild moderate mitral regurgitation. So that's our cardiac MRI scan report and so far so straightforward. But imagine that you're seeing the patient for follow up. Uh, or You're the GP and you're following the patient up and you've got a repeat uh, scan of the heart now to see how they're doing. Hopefully we've got their heart better with all the fantastic pills that we will have started this patient on and the fact that they have had their atrial fibrillation rate controlled and uh, that they've cut down the alcohol intake. So what do you make of this echocardiogram report? So anybody want to make any comment about this echo report? Yes, he's got a fast heart rate, hasn't he? So that's important. Well, why was the echo done? That's a good question. So if you've got severe LV impairment, very often, if you can control the heart rate and get them on medications, LV systolic function will improve and then you can tell the patient that their prognosis is better. It doesn't change uh, things that much, but patients like to know their prognosis is better. So that's the main reason for repeating it. Um, so the fast heart rate is very important to note. The very first thing I would do is point out that Actually, the echo quality here isn't that great. 
and that as soon as you see that you need to have a little bit of a pinch of salt but this fast heart rate we need to control the atrial fibrillation now we want it to below 100 maybe less stressed at attending for the scan and that would be worth doing a 24-hour take to look for rate control but that's not a good thing is it <clears throat> but look the left ventricle is only mildly impaired now it's got better so that's good isn't it we're still a bit bothered by the dilatation of it but it's good that it's only mildly impaired but what's this we have antroceptal hypokinesia and i assume that means hypokinesia of the inferior wall as well what does that mean when there's regional wall motion abnormalities on an echocardiogram? <clears throat> it means ischemia, very good. So this suggests the patient has had, uh, has developed ischemic heart disease or maybe had an infarct since they were discharged from hospital a few months ago. So what, what do you think of all that? What's happened to this patient? Are they doing OK? Do we need to readmit them and look at their coronary arteries? <clears throat> what about the mildly dilated aorta? Is that a problem? Is that one of those things you can just live with and you don't need to worry about? Or is a mildly dilated aorta not as mild as it sounds? So the answer to that is it's not as benign as it sounds. We shouldn't call mild aortic stenosis mild aortic stenosis. We should call it mild but going to need surgery at some point in the next 10 years or so aortic stenosis. It would be a bit of a mouthful, but it would help people understand what it, it meant for the patient. Mildly dilated aorta might stay the same if we have good blood pressure control, but aortic root surgery has a mortality even in a young fit person of about 10%. It's massive surgery. Um, and at some point you would expect this to progress and mild is maybe 45 millimetres. By the time it gets to 55 millimetres, you're looking at surgery, so it doesn't have much space to go. Ah, good. That's a nice full statement on the chat, Samantha. So call the patient, ask about symptoms and consider referring to cardiology to see if they want that following up. So do we think that they're likely to have had ischemia develop? They've improved function in their left and their right ventricle but they've improved function and developed ischemic heart disease when the cardiac mri scan if you remember said no evidence of ischemic heart disease that would be really odd wouldn't it to get both better and have an infarct at the same time so that doesn't make any sense and the other thing is anteroceptal and inferior that's two different territories of the heart that's not one coronary artery unless it's a very odd coronary artery so it seems highly highly unlikely that this is true and it seems likely that this is the quality of the scan letting us down so you could very well do what Samantha's just suggested and ask the patient and if they've had symptoms of chest pain developed then of course they could develop ischemic heart disease and you know this patient's a gentleman of a certain age who's probably not looked after himself very well with his heavy alcohol intake it's entirely possible that he's gone on to have acute coronary syndromes but it's pretty unlikely so assess the patient and if they don't fit with the picture of this echo you can discount that because the MRI scan has previously reassured us. If we hadn't got the MRI scan then maybe ischemic heart disease is the cause of the left ventricular systolic impairment in the first place. But what about this dilated aortic root? That's a concern isn't it? So can we reduce the drugs? I'll come back to the aortic root in a second. Everybody needs to vote for this. Do you want to say, yes, we can stop them all because these drugs, he's on the spironolactone and the 
uh, Sucubitril valsartan together, they can cause hyperkalemia, which can be life threatening and it needs regular monitoring. And that risk now, because his LV systolic function has improved, that now outweighs his risk from heart failure. Do you think the answer is A, we can stop them all? Or do you think we say B, no, carry them all on? You know, they're ex these expensive drugs are good because they'll stop him from getting heart failure again. Or how about C? We obviously have to balance risks and benefits here, and we know what we're doing for heart failure because NICE tells us what to do in order to treat heart failure when you've got good or bad ejection fractions. So maybe we should adjust the drugs and stop, say, the spironolactone and just use the, the, an ACE inhibitor. So lots of people answering B, B, B and 1C. Nobody wants to stop them all and save the patient the hassle of lots of pills. Isn't polypharmacy a bad thing? So I very much hope that uh, I, I am looked after by one of you in future years rather than the people that uh, stop the drugs for my patients. Because we know uh, from a study called Tread HF, which was only a small study, it was only 51 patients. But before this trial was done, you know, we always said don't stop the drugs because it recurred because we so often see patients who go off five, ten years later, their blood pressure is a bit low, they're asymptomatic of their low blood pressure, but their well-meaning doctors stop the uh, nasty hyper antihypertensives that have rescued their heart all those years ago, and then they represent with cardiomyopathy. Tread HF, their 51 patients had completely recovered and their markers of heart failure had normalized. And in the first group, 60% of the patient, uh, sorry, 40% of the patients relapsed with worsening NT, pro BNP or symptoms of heart failure and in the six months. So these patients do badly if you stop their drugs. And this patient, he still has a dilated left ventricle with mild LV systolic impairment. So it's critical that this patient carries on the drugs. I wouldn't carry on adding in drugs. So if their heart function is improved and uh, they uh, weren't taking sacubitral valsartan, for example, I wouldn't switch the ACE or ARB over to sacubitral valsartan or start dapagliflozin. What about this? dilated aortic root. So what are we going to do about that? I've just said that that's not a good thing. We're going to need to monitor this long term. Can anybody tell me if you know, shed any light on the carrying on of uh, on what we do with that dilated aortic root? What about the MRI scan? Would the MRI scan have seen a dilated aortic root? Yes, MRI scan is much better for dilated aortic root. Uh, doing nothing is not an option because at some point this aortic root is going to pop and then the patient will die and then somebody will spot that we should have been monitoring this and strictly controlling blood pressure um, and you know, regularly scanning to see if it's getting any bigger. So so we, we can't do nothing here. Uh, MRI is much better than echo for aortic root assessment. Repeating the echo with heart rate control might give you a better idea of left ventricular systolic function, but it won't improve the image quality. The image quality is poor because of patient habitus. And it might be COPD, it might be they're overweight. So can we just say, well, the MRI scan, that didn't say dilated aortic root, did it? So can we just say this is fine? There's a principle of, um, is it all right? Sorry, interrupted for a second about my list this afternoon. So there's a principle of investigations, and that is that 
if you ask a specialist a question and they're worth their salt, they'll give you an answer that is accurate. But if you randomly throw in some unrelated question uh, that, that you've not asked them, they're human and they might have missed it. So it's possible that in their looking to see what the left ventricular systolic function is like, that they won't have noticed that the aortic root is mildly dilated. They ought to have noticed, but everybody ought to do everything every day and things get missed every now and again. And it's no you know, shame that things do get missed. It's, it's human nature. We need to appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> So here, the fact that they haven't reported on the aortic root can't be taken to mean that it's not significant, but it can be taken to mean it probably isn't that bad and it may not be significant. So what we can do is notice that this patient weighs 113 kilos and is six foot three and write to the MRI specialist and say, if you index the aortic root to the, the patient's large dimensions, is it a normal size for this very large patient? And they'll write back, and they did in this case, write back and say, yep, yeah, it's absolutely fine. So I can simply reassure the patient and not worry about this further. So can you see how we need to adjust the size of something based on the patient's size, but we can ask specialists to reinterpret things, images that they've already done. And we can't take it for granted that they'll have spotted and reported on every possible detail of their of the, the, the examination. So if we, they might have overlooked something like a mildly dilated aortic root if they weren't particularly looking for that. Good. So patient three, this is a patient who's got very severe shortness of breath on minimal exertion and they've been being seen in Lincoln with severe mitral regurgitation. They've been seen many times there, they've had lots of tests done there and they've been told it's not severe mitral regurgitation but they're not happy with their doctors in Lincoln and so they've sent the patient for a second opinion for all of you to think about. And I've arranged for the patient to have an echocardiogram here. They've had echocardiograms done in Lincoln, so I could rely on those, but a part of giving a second opinion is satisfying a patient that you've looked again at the clinical situation. But I want you to help me now and tell me if this patient has severe mitral regurgitation. So this is the echo report. Can you tell me if the patient has severe mitral regurgitation or not? <clears throat> no, they do not is one answer. Can anybody expand on that or give me anything more? Now, if this patient has come all the way from Lincoln to see me, they need more than just a no. I need to explain it to them. Ah, very good. So we want to look at the atrial size. And Gagan is saying should have dilated LV if severe. Not necessarily. Uh, if they've decompensated, then the LV tends to be dilated. Um, it's it's very easy to pump blood the wrong way in mitral regurgitation. Uh, so if the LV function is normal and there's severe MR, actually that suggests the left ventricle is weak and it should be hyperdynamic. It should be pumping really hard and really well because it's so easy to pump blood into the left atrium. Uh, so you expect hyperdynamic left ventricle with severe MR uh, unless the left ventricle is getting weak and often you repair the valve and then you're left with significant left ventricular impairment damage caused by the heart having to work too hard for too long. So the normal sized LV 
is against long-standing severe MR, but it could still be either acute or it could be that the heart is compensated okay and now's the time to operate before the heart starts getting knackered by it. It would be slightly odd given the severity of the symptoms to have normal sized LV here. Um, so the report helpfully says mild to moderate mitral regurgitation. So you can just say, well, no, it's not severe. It only says mild to moderate over here. But we need to ask two other questions. And one of those is the atrial dimensions, which are down here. So if there's significant amount of blood leaking back into the left atrium, the left atrial volume is going to have to increase and therefore it's going to be dilated. Very acutely, if you develop mitral regurgitation today and you come into hospital today, it might not have had time to dilate, but it's clearly it's been going around for quite a while here. So the fact that the left atrium is a normal size is resoundingly clear information. The patient does not have severe MR. That single piece of information is all I need. So what I did is I went round and had a look at the views to satisfy myself that it was seen well enough for us to say definitively that the left atrium is normal size and it was and therefore this lady didn't have severe mitral regurgitation. But what is the other detail that I want about this mitral regurgitation? So it's what I said earlier on about functional and uh, primary valve pathology and I want to know is the valve leaking through the middle or is it leaking to the side? If the valve leaflets are prolapsing and are, are damaged in some way you get eccentric mitral regurgitation and eccentric mitral regurgitation can be quite difficult to see. You can get it with mitral with aortic regurgitation as well uh, you don't get it with stenosis. Stenosis is fairly straightforward. The valve is tight and you measure the pressure acro across the valve. But when you've got a leak, if the leak is shooting out sideways because of the way the valve is not working properly, then it can be quite difficult to measure it and you can underestimate it. So look out for eccentric in a description of mitral regurgitation. And as soon as you see eccentric, maybe we're underestimating it. If they've got a loud murmur, that you think is due to the MR, it's much more likely that it's significant. Uh, so loud murmurs and eccentric mitral regurgitations should um, make you alert to the situation. And we might want to do a transesophageal echocardiogram to really nail this down. Uh, but if it was a even moderate mitral regurgitation, we would be expecting the left atrium to be bigger. Uh, so I, I was satisfied as soon as I saw the left atrium was normal, that everything was fine. Um, we've put in the chat uh, about the pulmonary hypertension and that's another good thing to look for. So often if the left side of the heart isn't working well or a valve isn't working well, we get secondary pulmonary hypertension. That doesn't tell you the valve is, not, is, is severe or not. It can be there because of a severe valve problem, but if the valve problem has developed but not yet started to ruin the heart, they could still need to have the valve fixed but not have pulmonary hypertension. So it's something that develops and is a sign that if you don't act quickly, the heart's going to be even more badly damaged by it. But the pulmonary pressures don't have to be high. Just showing you what I mean about the valve dysfunction. Can you imagine this is a normal mitral valve with the cordy and the papillary muscles and pliable leaflets held in place? If the um, valve prolapse happens, then these cordy can be lengthened and this leaflet can fall back into the atrium slightly when the valve closes and that creates a gap. And you tend to get the jet occurring around eccentrically around the wall, not as this diagram I'm afraid shows it going straight through like this. It tends to be going round. I'll show you in a second. On the other hand, if it ruptures, you might see the leaflet tip flailing around and you get this strong jet of mitral regurgitation, which is again eccentric. Compare that with if the left atrium is very dilated, 
and the valve is no longer meeting properly in the middle and then you get a central jet of mitral regurgitation of functional mitral regurgitation and that is something that we don't tend to be able to do very much about by and large i'll show you what i mean here can you see that this leaflet is falling back into the left atrium whereas the anterior leaflet isn't can you see how this bows backwards into the left atrium? And if we put some colour across there, can you see this intense jet of blue that's going along the anterior wall because the posterior leaflet's falling through and it's making space to send a jet along the anterior wall of the left atrium. And that's not very much blue. It's a very intense jet, but normally you know, you're looking for a jet that hits the back wall. And this is why you can underestimate eccentric mitral regurgitation. And usually the sonographer will point that out to you, but just be aware of that. And bear in mind that you get knock on effects of cardiac dysfunction. So if something's not working well in the left ventricle, either one of the valves or the ventricle itself, it tends to dilate, particularly with regurgitation of a valve in order or, or weakness of the heart muscle to try and cope with that. Because you can imagine that if you're only ejecting 30% uh, of this volume, that might be still the same as 50% of this smaller volume. Because this side is not clearing the blood round very well, the pressures go up in the left atrium and the left atrium dilates. And that happens with any cause of higher pressure in the left side system because this is a thin walled structure and then because the pressures are higher here the pressures become higher in the lungs and you develop secondary pulmonary hypertension and dilation of the right ventricle so this is the knock-on effect that you get with heart dysfunction the right ventricle doesn't have a knock-on effect on the left but left-sided problems will eventually have a knock-on impact on the right side and very often when that's happened it becomes too late to fix the problem on the left because the problem on the right will just carry on getting worse great so some learning points here um, always always interpret imaging in the light of the clinical information that you've given you need to know why you've done the test so it was a great question earlier um, Samantha when you asked why the repeat echocardiogram was done poor image quality makes the interpret difficult but it often isn't straightforward to do more tests um, if somebody's obese and you can't get good echo images we could do an MRI scan we could do a transesophageal echocardiogram but these are not pleasant tests they're expensive tests there are limited numbers of these tests we can do we don't want to do it for all customers so we want to try and interpret where we can and safely interpret Remember aortic stenosis slowly progresses. It must be monitored in a patient who's a candidate for valve surgery. A 85 year old who's fairly frail and mild aortic stenosis, forget about it. You know, it'll be long, long time before they have problems with it. And if they present with breathlessness age 95 and they're otherwise fit enough for surgery, we can do it then. We, we don't need to monitor that patient, but a younger patient needs to be monitored. Remember that eccentric mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation suggests the problem with the valve and that that needs potentially to be monitored and potentially think about it being more severe than is suggested by the scan, particularly if the patient has significant symptoms. Remember how one chamber not working properly, one valve not working properly has a knock on effect on the rest of the heart. When you're asking a specific question of a specialist you can rely on the answer but if you haven't asked the question and there's something relatively mild which is unrelated to the question it can be overlooked because everyone's human and doesn't see everything every time and most importantly of all if you've got heart failure with left ventricular systolic impairment and it recovers with medication that doesn't mean you can stop the pills that are making the patient live longer. They need to carry on the medications. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? So I'll copy into the chat a link to get your certificate to say you've attended. So you can click on that now and give a rating and get your certificate. That will take you five minutes.
And if anybody hasn't clicked on it already, uh, my YouTube channel is here. So I'll upload this talk to the YouTube channel uh, over the next day or two. And there are plenty of other talks on there if you've missed any of them. But thank you very much for listening and uh, have a good weekend.